The atmosphere in the royal palace was tense. Zara's unexpected pregnancy had created an unsettling stay, not only among the nobles, but throughout the entire village. Whispers filled the marketplace and the village square. Many questioned how a young woman who had been preparing for a royal marriage could have brought such a scandal upon the kingdom. The villagers, though fond of their tradition and their chosen queen to be, were divided. Some still believed in her evil sense, while others whispered behind closed doors that the royal family might reconsider the marriage altogether. In the halls of the palace, the king and queen were also grappling with the situation. As rulers, they were not only responsible for the future of their son, but for the integrity of the entire kingdom. It was essential that they handled the matter with care, not only for Zara's sake, but to maintain the trust of their people. Although the prince had made it clear that he still supported Zara and loved her, the royal family knew they could not act hastily. After several days of consultations, the royal family decided to seek divine guidance. They summoned the chief priest, who was known for his deep connection to the gods and his wisdom in navigating difficult situations. When the chief priest arrived, the tension was palpable. Everyone awaited his verdict with bated breath. The chief priest spent hours in consultation, seeking direction from the gods. When he finally emerged, he addressed the royal family with calm authority. The gods have spoken, he declared. The child is innocent and the union between the prince and Zara is still blessed. However, the marriage must wait until the, after the child is born. Only then will balance be restored. This decision, though difficult, was accepted by the royal family. They would wait. Zara, who had feared she might lose everything, felt a wave of relief. The prince, always by her side, reassured her of his loyalty. We will weather the storm together, he promised her softly. Holding her hand, as they sat in the quiet of the palace gardens, his love was unwavering and his presence was Zara's source of strength through the turbulent times. Still, the path ahead was not easy. Zara knew that the village would continue to gossip and there was a part of her that struggled to come to terms with the fact that her marriage was being postponed. She often found herself walking through the palace gardens alone, her hand resting gently on her growing belly, thinking of the child that had changed everything. Though the pregnancy was a source of deep confusion, heartache, Zora resolved to face her future with courage. Only her loyal friend stood by her side through it all. She would visit Zara every day, bringing food and sitting with her in silence when words failed. I know you didn't do this when you would whisper, squeezing Zara's hand. We will find the truth. One evening, a man arrived at Amadi's household, an old acquaintance of Mr. Amadi. His presence was unexpected and he seemed nervous as he approached the house. It was Oye who first noticed the man speaking quietly with Mr. Amadi near the back of the compound. She couldn't hear everything, but what little she caught made her unease. The man was pleading with Mr. Amadi, and the look on her stepfather's face was one of panic. Oye quickly alerted Zara, and together they watched from a distance, trying to piece together what was happening. Later that night, Oye shared her suspicion with Zara. Something is not right, Zara, she whispered. That man knows something. The next morning, Onye confronted the man who was leaving the village to avoid suspicion. With sharp determination and persistence, she managed to coerce the truth from him. The man finally broke down and confessed everything. Mr. Amadi had arranged for him to drug Zara and have another man pay for the tax to take advantage of her while she was unconscious. Zara had no memory of it because she had been deeply sedated. Her pregnancy was the result of this horrific betrayal. Oye was horrified. She immediately ran to Zara and told her the truth. Zara felt as though the ground had been pulled from beneath her. Her own stepfather, the man who was supposed to protect her, had orchestrated this terrible act to ruin her life. At first, Zara couldn't believe it. But as the pieces of the puzzle came together, it all made sense. The strange looks from her stepfather, the way he had been so quick to accuse her, the man's sudden appearance at the house, it all pointed to one undeniable truth. Mr. Amadi had betrayed her in the worst way possible. Zara, with Oye by her side, immediately took the man's confession to the village elders. 
The trial had once been focused on accusing Zara. Now turned his attention to Mr. Amadi. The elders were shocked and outraged by the revelations and they summoned Mr. Amadi to explain himself. At first, Mr. Amadi denied everything, but the man's confession, along with other pieces of evidence, were too strong to ignore. Slowly, the truth came to light and Mr. Amadi's lies unraveled before the entire community. The village was outraged by Mr. Amadi's actions. The elders stripped him of the title as a chief and banished him from their community. His daughters, Eberi and Amanda, were sent away to live with their relatives as no one in their village wanted to be associated with such a terrible act. Mr. Amadi's name was forever tarnished and would live the rest of his life in shame. Zara, though devastated by the truth, found some peace in knowing that justice had been served. The prince, upon hearing the full story, came to Zara personally to offer her some strength which she needed. Though the road ahead was still difficult, Zara was now vindicated. After the confession, Zara's life slowly returned to some sense of normalcy. The community, realizing the depth of her suffering, rallied around her. Her strength and grace through such an unimaginable ordeal and had the respect of everyone in the village. Even the king and queen, who had once doubted her, was moved by her resilience. Though the path to healing was long, Zara found comfort in her friend and the support of the villagers. Oye, always by her side, remained her closest companion, helping her rebuild her life after the trauma she had endured. The prince allowed Zara and gave her space to heal, knowing that she had been true enough. Zara no longer felt like the servant girl who had been mistreated and abandoned by her family. She was now a symbol of strength and perseverance, who had faced great darkness and had come out on the other side. In time, Zara regained her sense of self and looked forward to the future with hope. She no longer saw herself as a forgotten stepdaughter, but as someone chosen by the gods for something greater. Though her journey had been filled with hardship, Zara knew her story was far from over. Meanwhile, life for Eberi and Amanda had become unbearable. After their father's disgrace and banishment, they had been sent to live with the distant relatives. At first, they had thought of it as temporary inconvenience, but as the weeks turned into months, they realized that their lives of luxury and ease were now far behind them. Their relatives had little patience for their spoiled ways. Unlike at home, where Zara had always catered to their every need, their relatives had expected them to contribute to the household, something neither sister was used to. Eberi, the elder of the two, had always been more ambitious and cunning. She spent her days complaining about how unfairly they had been treated, while Amanda, who had a weaker will, simply followed her sister's lead. They had never had to lift a finger in Amadi's household. Now they were asked to help with chores, cook meals, and even fetch water from the village well, tasks that were foreign to them. Their relatives were kind enough, but they were also strict. They didn't have time to pamper Eberi and Amanda, especially when they had children of their own to cater for. Day after day, the sisters grew more frustrated and resentful. The house where they now lived was small and the two girls were forced to share a cramped room. Gone were the days of comfortable beds and fine clothing. Instead, they were treated as ordinary girls with no special privileges. It was a reality they could hardly bear. One afternoon, as the sisters struggled to complete the daily chores, Eberic sat down heavily on his stool, her face flushed with anger. I can't take this anymore, she hissed, wiping sweat from her brow. This is not how we are meant to live. Amanda, sitting beside her, nodded in agreement. What are we supposed to do? We can't go back home, and no one here cares about us. Eberic was silent for a moment. Deep in thoughts, her mind worked quickly. Piecing together a plan, she knew there was one person who might still take them in, Zara. Though they had treated their elder sister with contempt for years, Eberi understood that Zara's soft heart was her greatest weakness. Zara is in the palace now, she said slowly, as an idea began to form. If we can convince her to let us stay, we will be free from all of this. She owes us. After all, we are still family. Amanda's eyes widened. But well, do you think she will agree after everything we've done? Eberi smirked. Zara is too soft to refuse us. She's always been weak. When it comes to us, we'll go to her, beg for her forgiveness, and she will take us in. Once we're in the palace, we'll be living like royalty. The two sisters wasted no time. That very evening, 
they left their relatives home and made their way to the palace, rehearsing their pleas as they walked. When they arrived, they were greeted by the palace guards, who hesitated to let them in. But when the guards informed Zara that her sisters were waiting outside, she immediately ordered them to be allowed in. Zara, ever the forgiving soul, was surprised to see her sisters, but welcomed them warmly. Eberi and Amanda, dressed in simple clothes, and looking far more humble than Zara had ever seen them, knelt before her in tears. Zara, we've made terrible mistakes, Eberi began, with false sincerity. We've lost everything. Father is gone and we are all alone. Please let us stay with you. We promise we'll change. Amanda nodded quickly, adding, We are scared, Zara. We don't know how to live without you. Please forgive us. Zara looked at her sisters with pity. Despite everything they had done to her, they were still her family. How could she turn them away? Oye, who had been standing quietly nearby, shot Zara a warning look. She had never trusted a bear and Amanda, and their sudden return made her unease. Zara, Oye whispered, I don't think this is a good idea. They are only here because they need something. You've seen how they've treated you before. But Zara's heart was too kind. They are my sisters, she said softly. If I don't help them, who will? Against Oye's advice, Zara allowed Eberi and Amanda to move into the palace. The sisters smiled gratefully, but as soon as they were alone, their true intentions began to surface. Eberi's mind was already racing with plans on how to turn the situation to her advantage. She had no intentions of living quietly under Zara's kindness. No, Eberi had far bigger ambitions, starting with the prince. For the first few weeks, Eberi and Amanda seemed to settle into the palace life without issues. They were careful not to raise any suspicion and acted grateful for Zara's generosity. They ate the food provided by the palace, slept in comfortable bed, and most importantly, they no longer had to do chores. The palace servants did everything for them, fetching water, cleaning their wounds, and tending to their clothes. Eberi and Amanda quickly slipped back into their old habits of laziness, lounging around the palace as though they had always belonged there. However, while Amanda seemed content to enjoy the luxury of the palace, Eberi's mind was always working. She watched Zara closely, noting how the prince continued to support her despite the pregnancy. Eberi felt the familiar pang of jealousy deep in her chest. She had always thought herself more beautiful and more charming than Zara. So how was it that Zara had been chosen to be queen while she was left with nothing? The more she watched Zara and the prince together, the more her envy grew. One evening, Eberi decided to put her plans into action. She waited until the prince was alone, walking through one of the palace corridors. After a long day of meetings with the council, Eberi had chosen her moments carefully she had spent extra time preparing herself, wearing one of her finest dresses, and arranging her hair in a way that accentuated her beauty. As she approached the prince, her heart raced with anticipation. She was sure her charm would work, just as he had on so many others before. Your Highness, Eberi said softly, her voice sweet and melodic. As she stepped into his part, the prince, surprised to see her, offered a polite smile but did he stop walking? Is there something I can help you with, Eberi? He asked, his tone kind but distant. Eberi took a deep breath and fell into step beside him. Her eyes filled with what she hoped was a mixture of sorrow and longing. I wanted to talk to you about Zara. She began, choosing her words carefully. I've been thinking a lot about her situation and about your future. The prince raised an eyebrow, allowing Eberi to continue. I know Zara is important to you, Eberi said, her voice soft and full of false concern. But I worry about what's best for the kingdom. She's been through so much, and with the child, well, I just want to make sure you're making the right decision. The priest's expression didn't change, but his steps slowed. Eberi took this as a sign that her words were having the desired effect. She pressed on, stepping closer to him and lowering her voice to a near whisper. I care about you, your highness. I care about what's best for you and for the future of this kingdom. You deserve someone who can stand by your side 
someone who is strong and capable of leading. Zara, she's kind, but she's weak. We need someone better. The prince stopped walking and turned to face a berry. Fully, his eyes narrowing slightly. And who do you suggest that someone should be? He asked, his voice calm but next with an urge. Ebere smiled, her heart fluttering in her chest. This was her moment. I can be that person, she said confidently. Placing a hand gently on the prince's arm, I can be everything you need. For a moment, there was silence. Ebere's heart racing as she waited for the prince's response, certain he would see the truth in her words. But when the prince spoke, his voice was cold and firm. I think you misunderstand the bird, he said gently, removing her hand from his arm. Zara is the one I have chosen. She will be my wife and nothing will change that. I appreciate your concern, but I suggest you focus on your own life, instead of trying to interfere in ours. A bear felt her stomach joke, her face flushed with humiliation. The prince's rejection was swift and final. She had overestimated her influence and now she was left standing alone, her plan in ruin. The prince gave her one last glance before turning and walking away, leaving a very seated with frustration. The next morning, Zara sat with Oye in the palace garden, enjoying the calm of the early morning air. Zara's pregnancy was beginning to show, and though she felt a growing connection with the child, she also struggled with the fear of what lay ahead. The delay in her marriage to the prince weighed heavily on her heart, and the judgment stares from some of the palace servants haven't gone unnoticed. Oye, Emma the loyal friend, tried to distract Zara from her worries by talking about lighter subjects, but Zara could see the concern in her friend's eyes. You've been quiet today, Zara said gently, turning to face her friend. What's on your mind? Oye has stated for a moment before speaking. It's your sister's, she said finally, her voice low. Something doesn't feel right. They've been here for weeks now, and they're doing nothing but lounging around while the servants do all the work. And I heard rumors that a berry tried to approach the prince last night. Zara frowned. What do you mean she approached him? I don't know all the details, Oye admitted, but the servants are whispering that a berry spoke to him alone. Zara, I don't trust her. I never have. I think you should send them away. Zara felt a pile of guilt. She had noticed her sister's behavior, but had convinced herself that they were just adjusting to the palace life. She had wanted to believe that despite everything, her sisters could change. But Oye's words made her question that hope. They've been through a lot, Zara said, though her voice lacked conviction. I can't just send them away. They're my family. Oye signed, her expression softening. I know you love them, Zara, but sometimes you have to protect yourself. They've never treated you well, and now I just don't want to see you get hurt again. Zara looked away, her heart heavy. She knew Oye was right, but the idea of turning her sisters out weighed on her conscience. I'll talk to them, she promised, though in her heart she doubted it would make much difference. While Zara was dealing with the palace insurance, Far away in the isolated house where Mr. Amadi lived, a new problem was brewing. His health had taken a sharp decline in the months since his banishment. He spent most days laying in bed, weak and unable to move without assistance. His wife's proud and commanding presence into a shadow of itself, leaving him bitter and alone. At first, Mr. Amadi tried to hide his illness, unwilling to show the world, or even his daughters, his weakness. But as the condition worsened, he had no choice but to send words to Eberi and Amanda, hoping they would come to his aid. The message he sent was short and desperate. I am gravely ill. Come quickly, or you may not see me again. The messenger arrived at the palace one evening, slipping through the gates unnoticed by the villagers. Mr. Amadi had taken great care to keep his illness secret, not wanting anyone in the village to know of his plight. Only his daughters were informed of his condition and the message reached Eberi and Amanda before anyone else. When they read the note, Eberi scoffed. Why should we care? She said, tossing the letter aside with a sneer. He is the reason we are in this mess. He is the one who ruined everything for us. Let him rot. Amanda, though well received, nodded in agreement. 
We've barely heard from him since the banishment. He abandoned us the same way he abandons her. Neither has felt no desire to go to the village or to help the father who had brought them so much shame. The life they had lived under his roof, full of comfort and luxury, was gone. The sisters were consumed by their anger towards him, refusing to acknowledge any sense of duty or responsibility. As far as they were concerned, Mr. Amadi's illness was his own problem and they wanted no part of it. The days passed and Mr. Amadi's condition worsened. In his desperation, he sent another message, this time directly to Zara. He knew that despite everything he had done to Zara, Zara had always been a soft-hearted woman. If anyone would come to his aid, it would be her. Zara received the message late one evening. She was in her chambers, reflecting on the recent changes in her life. When one of the palace servants handed her the letter, as she read the words, her heart sank. Mr. Amadi, her stepfather, the man who had caused her so much pain and heartache, was asking for her help. She stared at the letter for a long time, unsure of what to do. A part of her wanted to ignore the plea, to turn her back on the man who had turned his back on her so many years ago. But another part of her, the past that still believed in the value of family, felt a pull to help him, even if he didn't deserve it. Zara knew she couldn't make this decision alone. The next morning, she sought out Onye, hoping her friend could offer some guidance. They sat together in the palace garden. The sun filtering through the trees as Zara handed Oye the letter. Oye read it quickly and frowned. Zara, you can't go, she said firmly, handing the letter back. He's only reaching out because he has no one else left. After everything he has done to you, you don't owe him anything. I know, Zara replied, her voice soft and uncertain. But if he truly is dying, can I just ignore him? He raised me, Oye. I don't know if I can live with myself if I don't at least see him one last time. Oye shook her head, her expression filled with concern. He doesn't deserve your kindness. I know you have a good heart, Zara, but this man is dangerous. You already suffered enough because of him. What if he tries to hurt you? Zara sighed, torn between her sense of duty and her desire to protect herself. I'll be careful, she promised, though her own doubts lingered. I'll go see him. But I won't stay long. I just... I need to know if he truly regrets what he did. Oye remained unconvinced. But she knew there was no change in Zara's mind. Once she had made the decision. If you must go, then at least let me come with you, she said. I don't want you going there alone. Zara smiled gratefully at her friend. Thank you, Oye. I don't know what I'll do without you. Zara left for the village the next morning, accompanied by Oye. They traveled quietly, avoiding the curious eyes of the villagers. Mr. Amadi's banishment was still a sensitive topic, and Zara didn't want to draw attention to herself. When they reached Mr. Amadi's small isolated home, the air was thick with an airy silence. Zara entered the house cautiously, her heart pounding in her chest. Mr. Amadi lay on the bed, looking through and glancing at the shadows of a man she once knew. His eyes were hollow and his skin was pale. He turned his head slowly as Zara approached, his gaze flickering with a mixture of surprise and something darker. You came, he rasped, his voice weak and strained. Zara nodded, standing a few feet away from his bed. I did. I heard you were sick. Mr. Amadi coughed a harsh rattling sound that filled the small room. I didn't think you would come, he muttered, his eyes narrowing slightly. After everything, I came because she asked me to, Zara said, her voice steady but guarded. What do you want from me? Mr. Marty gestured weakly to a small table by his bed. There is some water there. Pour me a glass. Zara hesitated for a moment, but eventually did as he asked. She picked up the jug of water and poured a small amount into a glass, handing it to her stepfather. Mr. Marty took it with trembling eyes, but his eyes never left Zara's face. As he drank, Zara noticed something strange. The water he had asked for had an unusual smell. Bitter, almost metallic. Her heart raced as a terrible suspicion began to form in her mind. Suddenly, Mr. Amadi's expression changed. A twisted smile appeared on his lips as he watched her. You've always been too trusting, Zara, he whispered. His voice filled with malice. You never saw the truth. 
Zora's breath caught in her throat. She stepped back, her hand instinctively moving to her belly. What did you do? She asked, her voice shaking. Before Mr. Amadi could answer, Zara felt a sharp pain in her abdomen. Her vision blurred as she stumbled backward, gasping for air. Onye rushed into the room, panic in her eyes as she grabbed Zara by the arm. We need to go, she shouted, pulling Zara towards the door. They barely made it out of the house before Zara collapsed, clutching her stomach in agony. Onye screamed for help and within minutes, the villagers had gathered around, carrying Zara back to the palace. Zara lay unconscious in the palace for several days, her body ripped from the effects of the poison. The royal healer worked tirelessly to keep her alive, but the toll on her body was severe. The news of her condition spread quickly throughout the palace and beyond, and the prince was inconsolable. He had been by her side. The moment she was brought back, refusing to leave her even for a moment, when Zara finally woke, her surroundings were blood, but the first face she saw was the prince. His eyes were red with expression aged with worry and relief. Zara had whispered in his voice hoarse. You are awake. Zara blinked, trying to remember what had happened. She felt a dull ache in her abdomen as she slowly regained her senses. The memory of the poisoning came flooding back. Her hands instinctively moved to her belly, and that's when the truth hit her. Her baby gone. Apparently, in the jug of water which Zara carried, to give Mr. Amadi to drink, had contained a poison which, when inhaled, has adverse effects on your body. But Mr. Amadi had taken precaution to take the antidote before she came. Tears rolled up in her eyes as the weight of her loss settled over her. The baby, she whispered, her voice barely audible. The priest took her hand in his, squeezing it gently, his face full of sorrow. He said softly, the healer did everything he could, but the poison it was too much. Zara closed her eyes, feeling a wave of grief wash over her. She lost her child, the one thing she had clung to as a symbol of her future, and it had been taken from her by the man who had already caused her so much pain, her own stepfather. The creator of it all was almost too much to bear. Oye sat beside her, offering silent support, her hand resting on Zara's arms. She had been dead the whole time praying for her friend's recovery. But knowing that the emotional wound would take far longer to heal than the physical one. As Zara lay in recovery, the prince's frustration with her family reached its peak. He had tolerated a bear and Amanda for Zara's sake. But after the poisoning attempt, his patience was gone. He summoned the royal council and made a firm decision. A bear and Amanda could no longer stay in the palace. They had brought nothing but trouble and disrespect and it was time for them to face the consequences of their actions. The prince approached Zara gently. Knowing that despite everything, she still harbored some affection for her sisters. Zara, he began, sitting beside her bed. I can't allow them stay here any longer. They've done nothing but take advantage of you, and I can't forgive them for the way they've acted. I need to protect you. Zara, still waiting from her ordeal, nodded slowly. Deep down, she knew he was right. Her sisters had shown her no kindness, only selfishness. You're right, she whispered. It's time they lived. The priest gave the order, and Neberi and Amanda were summoned to the royal chambers. They arrived with smoked expression, still believing they could manipulate their way through any situation. But when they were informed of the priest's decision, their arrogance quickly turned to panic. What do you mean we have to leave? Eberi demanded, her voice rising in disbelief. We are family. You can't just throw us out like common beggars. The priest's face remained calm but firm. You've had every chance to leave here, respectfully, and you've done nothing but disrespect Zara and this household. You've abused the kindness shown to you, and you brought more harm than good. It's time for you to leave. Amanda, who had always followed Eberi's need, looked shocked but said nothing. She had known that their behavior would catch up with them eventually, but she hadn't expected it to happen so suddenly. The sisters begged and pleaded, but the prince's decision was final. They were escorted out of the palace, forced to return to a home they no longer recognized or knew how to manage. Back in their childhood home, with all the comfort and luxury they had grown accustomed to, Eberi and Amanda quickly realized how much they have taken for granted. The house had fallen into despair since their father's banishment without servants or help. They were left to fend for themselves. 
the reality of the situation hit hard. They had never learned how to cook, clean, or even maintain the basics of a household. The servant had always done everything for them, and without Zara, who had silently shouldered the burden for so many years, they were lost. A berry. Tried to maintain control, backing others as Amanda, seemed they were still in the palace, but it didn't take long for the frustrations to land. Days passed, and the house grew dirtier and more chaotic. The sisters fought constantly, each blaming the other for their downfall. Zara was always the one who did all of this, Amanda muttered one evening as they sat in the dimly lit kitchen room, surrounded by dirty dishes and unwashed clothes. We never even noticed. A very still bitter snap back. Don't talk about her like that. She's the reason we are in this mess. If she hadn't been chosen by the priest, none of this would have happened. Even as she said the words, a better knew they weren't true. Deep down, she realized they had been the ones to drive Zara away. Zara had always been the one to hold the family together. Even when they treated her as nothing more than a servant, without her, they were helpless. As the sisters struggled in their broken home, words came from the village that their father, Mr. Amadi, had passed away. His death was not unsuspected, given the deteriorating health. But the manner of his passing left many in the villagers unsettled. It was a punishment from the gods, a slow and painful illness that left him isolated and alone. Others whispered that it was a curse of their own wickedness, and the evil he had done had come back to him. When news of his death reached Zara, she felt a strange mixture of emotions. There was no joy in hearing of his suffering. There was also no grief. The man who had once been her father had become a stranger long they go, and the final act of betrayal he had committed against her had sealed any hope of reconciliation. No one in the village mourned for Mr. Amadi. His daughters did not attend his burial, and the villagers kept their distance, wary of the darkness that had followed him in his final days. It was as though his name had been erased from the community, leaving only a faint memory of the man he once was. As time passed, Zara began to heal, not just physically, but emotionally as well. The loss of her child was a wound that would never fully close. But she found strength in the love and support of the prince and her friend Oye. The prince remained patient, giving her all the time she needed to recover. He never pressured her, never rushed her. Instead, he stood by her side, offering quiet encouragement as she slowly regained her strength. In the months that followed, Zara learned to build a thicker skin. She had faced betrayal from her family, the loss of her child and the judgment of the villagers. But through it all, she had emerged stronger. She had once been a servant in her old home, treated as less than her sisters. But now she stood tall, knowing her work and the love she deserved. When Zara was finally ready, the marriage between her and the prince was held in a grand ceremony attended by the entire village. The celebration was a symbol of hope, a renewal, a chance for Zara to embrace her future without the shadows of her past. She and the prince were finally united as husband and wife, and the village rejoiced at their union. Though the road to happiness had been long and painful, Zara knew she had grown stronger through every challenge she had faced. In time, and she and the prince welcomed children of their own, and the palace was filled with sounds of laughter and love. Zara had found peace, not only with her past, but with the life she had built with the prince. As the years went by, she often thought of her sisters, wondering what had become of them. But she no longer held the same sadness or guilt she had done where she could for them. And now, it was their journey to walk alone. Zara had learned the most important lesson of all, that strength is not found in avoiding pain, but in rising above it. Tell me if you enjoyed this story below. Thank you and I'll see you in my next one. Bye. Thank you so much for watching till the end. Please click on the subscribe button to support us. Turn on the post notification to get notified when I upload a new story. Like, share and comment your thoughts. Till then, bye.